The operator of Japan's crippled nuclear plant is making progress in a risky operation. Workers with Tokyo Electric Power Company are transferring fuel rod assemblies from the Reactor 4 building to a safer storage pool. They have more than 1,500 units to move over the next, week, next year. But what happens when the nuclear waste after that is unknown? NHK World's Noriko Okada reports. Workers at Fukushima Daiichi celebrated a small victory. They finished transferring 22 unused fuel assemblies from the reactor building into a storage pool nearby. Later, they will start removing spent fuel rods from the building. They are far more radioactive than unused ones. But TEPCO and other utilities will face a challenge down the road. We are to store nuclear waste long term. Originally, the industry and government planned to recycle it. But technical problems have brought the project to a standstill. The recycling plant has never gone into operation. What's more, there is no final disposal site yet in Japan. Government officials are considering burying nuclear waste more than 300 meters underground. In 2000, they asked municipalities around the country to host the site. None has volunteered. Nuclear-powered nations around the world are dealing with the same problem. Only Finland and Sweden have chosen final storage site for their nuclear waste. The president of the company managing Sweden's site has visited Japan to give advice to government officials. Magnus Holmgubist says he chose the best suited place based on geological surveys. Then he found a site by negotiating with cities in the area that host nuclear-related facilities. Learning from us and others, uh, picking the raisins, picking the good pieces, but the process has to be developed within Japan, uh, a process that suits your conditions, not ours. The crisis at Fukushima Daiichi has made Japanese even more wary of nuclear waste. Municipal authorities aren't keen on burying it beneath their communities. But there are more than 25,000 spent fuel rods in the country. Experts agree storing it at nuclear plants is unsustainable. And at some point, government and industry must find a long-term storage site. Noriko Okada, NHK World, Tokyo. The utility in charge of Japan's damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant is now considering decommissioning every reactor at the facility. The 2011 earthquake and tsunami crippled four reactors at the plant. Two other units were left largely undamaged, but they likely won't go back online. Tokyo Electric Power Company executives hadn't officially ruled out using reactors 5 and 6 to generate electricity in the future. Now they say they'll decide what to do with the units after they speak with authorities in Fukushima Prefecture and in the towns that host the plant. Their official decision could come next month. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has urged them to scrap the reactors. He says they should concentrate on dealing with the series of problems, including leaks of radioactive water. TEPCO officials plan to use the two reactors to train workers involved in decommissioning the four damaged units. The utility is already organizing funding for decommissioning reactors 5 and 6. But it is expected to fall short by more than $250 million if the decision to decommission the reactors is made during the current fiscal year through next March. TEPCO is allowed to raise power rates to make up the difference. Crews at the plant are also making progress in their effort to deal with the growing amount of radioactive water on site. They're testing a decontamination system. Workers wanted to start using the Advanced Liquid Processing System, or ALPS, this year. 
It is designed to remove 62 kinds of radioactive substances, inclu excluding tritium. But they suspended a test run in June after they discovered corrosion of a tank allowed unprocessed water to escape. They have fixed the problem and restarted tests on all three of the system's lines. TEPCO officials say they found that ALPS can't fully remove four radioactive materials, including cobalt and antimony. They say they will improve the system before making it fully operational next year. TEPCO plans to add more lines to the system. They want to decontaminate all radioactive water at the plant by March 2015. Now, NHK has learned that Tokyo Electric Power Company aims to restart some of the reactors at its nuclear plant in central Japan next July. TEPCO representatives say restarting the Kashiwazaki Kariwa plant in Niigata Prefecture will help revive their business after the nuclear accident at Fukushima Daiichi. The number six and seven reactors will undergo safety checks by the government's nuclear regulation authority. This is part of the procedures for restarting nuclear plants. TEPCO has set the target date for next July. The checks will take at least six months. The utility needs to negotiate with the plant's host communities. If all goes well with TEPCO's plan, the utility is estimated to post a pre-tax profit of more than $1 billion in the business year that starts next April. Representatives say if the reactors cannot return online until January 2015, it will post a pre-tax loss of $130 million. The loss is projected to grow to $800 million if the restart is delayed until March 2015. They also aim to restart the number one and five reactors in the spring of 2015. The global nuclear watchdog says it will send a team of experts to Japan next week to inspect decommissioning work at Fukushima Daiichi. The Japanese government asked the International Atomic Energy Agency to send the team. Nineteen IAEA and international experts will start a 10-day visit on Monday. They'll travel to the plant to observe work to remove nuclear fuel from the Reactor 4 building. They'll also conduct hearings with officials from the government and TEPCO. And they'll be examining how workers are managing radioactive wastewater at the plant. Earlier this month, analysts working for the IAEA checked marine pollution around Fukushima Daiichi. The inspectors arriving next week will follow up on that work and then submit a report to the government. The earthquake and tsunami that ravaged northeastern Japan in March 2011 killed more than 18,000 people. Giant waves have pummeled the region many times in the distant past as well, and residents have tried to leave records of those events. Now, some researchers believe the old accounts can help prevent future disasters. NHK World's Takafumi Teri reports. Yukiko Dazai is an amateur historian. She explores areas in northeastern Japan focusing on geographical names. Dazai says many locations have links to past disasters. This area is called Obunezawa. The name means Big Ship Stream. It's almost three kilometers inland, yet a local legend says that a ship was swept there by a tsunami that occurred long ago. This place is so deep in the mountains that I never believed a ship or a tsunami could reach this far. But on March 11th, the tsunami did reach here, so I realized that the legend was probably true. Dazai says place names may hold messages from people living in the area centuries ago. She asks locals about these tales. I feel very strongly that place names are important. The locals have suffered from tsunamis for many generations. I think these names reflect their experiences. It's not only amateur historians that are studying the past for clues to dangers in the future. Researchers at a national university are digging into the archives to help them prepare for disasters. Last year, 
Tohoku University established the International Research Institute of Disaster Science. <laughs> Historian Arata Hirakawa is the director. He studies old documents to see how people dealt with past disasters. The tsunami two years ago inundated the Sendai Plain. Hirakawa superimposes a map of the flooded areas over one from the 17th century. He found that the 2011 tsunami didn't affect the old main road in nearby villages. He says this knowledge could have helped to lessen the damage from the disaster. It's possible that the highway and towns were built in places that people felt were safe based on their experience with the many tsunamis that had hit the area. Hirakawa collaborates with other researchers specializing in the science of tsunamis. They are now looking at one that struck in 1611. Researchers had assumed the tsunami was caused by an earthquake with a magnitude of 8.1. But Hirakawa and his team made new findings. They now believe the quake had a magnitude of 8.5. Hirakawa says that if such a massive quake did occur 400 years ago, tsunamis might hit the region more often than previously thought. Hirakawa presents the results of the research in lectures. He hopes to have more opportunities to exchange views with other researchers. If amateur historians dig deeper into the history of disasters in their area and present their research locally, I think our society can develop greater resistance to these catastrophic events. Local residents have left a legacy of their experiences. By uncovering these stories, Dazai and Hirakawa believe they can offer life-saving wisdom to future generations. Takahumi Terui, NHK World. Japanese delegates have been forced to defend themselves. Their government announced during the conference that it would lower emissions targets. This target may appear to be less ambitious. However, this is an ambitious target. Japanese leaders have been struggling to revise their energy policy after the nuclear accident two years ago at Fukushima Daiichi. For their new target, they've set a base year of 2005. By 2020, they want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 3.8%. But Ishihara said the new target is tentative. He said it does not take into account the emissions cuts possible when using nuclear plants. But others at the conference are lining up with their criticisms. Now is not the time to lower the target. Japan should aim to meet the previous target. Generally speaking, I'm very disappointed with the new target. Whatever their explanation is, we want to see action. We want to see results. The U.S. Special Envoy for Climate Change defended Japan. Todd Stern said the country is under special circumstances after the accident in Fukushima. Delegates from more than 190 countries and regions are trying to find common ground on an issue that's affecting communities worldwide. They're meeting in Warsaw to work out the details of a new framework for cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Ministers and other negotiators at the United Nations Climate Change Talks have been debating the issue since last week. The new framework will apply to all countries from 2020. It will replace the Kyoto Protocol, which only binds some industrialized nations. Environment ministers want to finalize an agreement in 2015. They'll discuss a timeline for countries to submit their reduction targets. But they're yet to go into the specifics of the framework. Under the Kyoto Protocol, Japan pledged to reduce its emissions by an average of 6% by 2012 compared to 1990 levels. Environment Minister Nobuteru Ishihara says it's achieved that goal. Some claim Tokyo's new target for 2020 and beyond is too low. But Ishihara says it's important to note that Japan's giving technical and financial help to developing countries to achieve their reduction targets. Deep divisions remain among the parties meeting in Warsaw. NHK World's Mitsuko Nishikawa reports. Kiribati is a small island nation in the Pacific Ocean. By mid-century, 
rising ocean levels could leave 80% of the main island underwater. Many homes are already vulnerable to high tides. Experts also point out a possible link between global warming and severe weather. A recent example was Typhoon Haiyan, which devastated part of the Philippines, leaving nearly 4,000 people dead and 1,600 more missing. A report from the International Panel on Climate Change says that if countries fail to act, average temperatures on the planet could rise by up to 4.8 degrees by the end of the century. The international community has agreed to try to keep this temperature rise within 2 degrees, but officials at the UN Environment Program say the pace of current measures is too slow. In an emotional intervention, a negotiator from the Philippines urged his counterparts from around the world to act quickly. We can fix this. We can stop this madness right now, right here, in the middle of this football field and stop moving the goalposts. We're not receiving justice. The delegate went as far as starting a hunger strike to underline his commitment. Other participants to the conference have decided to join him. The purpose of this year's conference is to lay the groundwork for a new climate agreement that regulates greenhouse gas emissions beyond 2020. UN officials hope the agreement can be signed in 2015. But so far, negotiators have failed to achieve real progress. The European Union and the United States disagree over when countries should submit their commitments to limit greenhouse gas emissions. And developing countries insist that mandatory measures should apply only to industrialized nations whom they consider historically responsible for global warming. Developing countries are also demanding that a new fund be set up to help them deal with the adverse consequences of climate change. But many industrialized nations are reluctant to contribute additional funds. Some experts are pessimistic about the prospect of an agreement before the end of the conference. Ministers from the developed countries will be forced to propose something concrete regarding climate finance or climate compensation to the damage caused by the climate change. Otherwise, developing countries will condemn the developed countries more strongly. It may take time to get any consensus, concrete position or answer on this issue for each country. We have only four days to go and I'm not sure we have enough time. Japan announced last week that it will be scaling down its self-imposed greenhouse gas reduction targets. The decision drew considerable international criticism and it may serve as a pretext for other countries not to commit to ambitious targets. Mitsuko Nishikawa NHK World. A volcanic eruption in the Pacific Ocean a thousand kilometers south of Tokyo is creating a new islet in the Ogasawara island chain. Japan's government is hoping this will lead to an expansion of the country's territorial waters. Officials at the Japan Meteorological Agency say the new landmass emerged about 500 meters southeast of Nishinoshima Island in the Ogasawara group. An NHK camera crew took footage of the new islet forming on Thursday. Eruptions occurred every 30 to 60 seconds with plumes of black smoke and ash flying into the air. The Japan Coast Guard says the islet expanded by 100 meters in length between Wednesday and Thursday. Officials say it's now 400 meters long north-south. I hope our waters will expand. That is, if the land becomes an official island. If the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea recognizes the landmass as an island, Japan's territorial waters would expand by about 500 meters south of it. But Coast Guard officials say the new landmass might be eroded by waves. Fishery officials from around the world are divided on how to evaluate stocks of Atlantic bluefin tuna. They need to reach an agreement to determine future fishing quotas.
The differences in opinion surfaced on Tuesday at the annual meeting of the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. Delegates from countries that harvest the fish, such as Spain, Malta and Morocco, argued that stocks have recovered. But those from the United States and other countries are cautious about raising quotas. They say recovery is still uncertain. People in Japan consume the most bluefin tuna. Japanese delegates are expected to emphasize their active approach to conserve the species. They're hoping this will allow them to harvest more bluefin next year. Japanese rice farmers renewed calls demanding the government take more time to review a subsidy program for them. The policy was implemented 40 years ago to stop rice prices from falling. About 700 rice producers and agricultural cooperative officials gathered in Tokyo. Lawmakers from the governing coalition also attended the meeting. This is a major turnaround of rice policy. The government should deal with it thoroughly and cautiously in order to prevent confusion among producers. The government aims to make the agricultural sector more competitive by ending the subsidy program by fiscal 2018. It also plans to sharply slash subsidies for farmers who take part in acreage reduction starting next year.